Please help me welcome Dave Birch. <clears throat> Thank you very welcome, much, Dave. Lauren. Thank you for the introduction. Yes, uh, Lauren set me quite an interesting challenge for the first session. So he said, uh, can you tell people something about the future of money? Uh, and you have uh, 20 minutes, because it's not really a very big topic. So we can move through it quite quickly and get on to some questions. Um, I did think about one or two different approaches. Uh, I, could, I could just make some shit up. I mean, that would, that would work pretty well. You know, I could tell you, you know, on the year 3000, we'll all be living on Alpha Centauri and using banknotes made out of antimatter. I mean, that might be a reasonable uh, prediction. Uh, but unfortunately, as you know, this morning CERN discovered it had a faulty cable. So I'm afraid faster than light travel can't form part of my presentation. Uh, any further. So what I decided to do uh, instead was um, I decided to look at some scenarios, some different scenarios for the future, and then try and see what those scenarios would mean for money. And again, I was faced with the prospect of, you know, just making some scenarios up. Uh, that sounds pretty reasonable. But unfortunately, um, because I'm a consultant, I'm not allowed to do that. There are very strict EU rules uh, on this sort of thing. Uh, which constrain the way we can explain things. And I'll show you that in two ways. I want to make one point that's going to be the backdrop to everything that I'm going to say. You're sick of hearing this over and over again, but it is that William Gibson thing, right? Which is the future's already here, it's just very unevenly distributed. In other words, if we want to construct some reasonable ideas about what money will look like a generation from now, actually all of the technologies that are needed to revolutionize it are already here. It's just a question of looking round to see what some people call the weak signals for change. The technology is already, we don't have to wait for time travel or whatever, the technologies already exist. And so I've got one picture to sum this up. This is, a, this is a, a ca an internet cafe in Botswana, and I think this one picture uh, summarizes the future uh, rather well. You see, like, you see all the things the cafe does, digital downloading, all entirely legally, of course, completely actor and SOPA compliant. Uh, internet cafe, photos, oh, and by the way, soft drinks. That's the last thing on the cafe menu now. You'll notice all the subtitles aren't in an African language either. The future's already here. So how can we make sense of that? Well, we have to put it into a two-by-two two matrix. You know the law. Uh, I have no choice about this kind of thing. So the question is, what can I use for the axes of my two-by-two two matrix that will give me four scenarios uh, that make sense to you and make for an interesting conversation? And I chose this breakdown. There's an outfit called Long Finance, which are connected with the Long Now, Corporation, uh, the Long now Foundation. And Long Finance, uh, just a couple of months ago, published a very interesting report on scenarios for the future of finance to 2050. And so I thought that, you know, 2050, that would be a reasonable, right? Like, because none of you guys are going to be around to call me on it then. So it's far enough out, I can have some fun. Uh, but it's, you know, just on the boundaries of the strategic planning horizon if you're involved in product development. So, so 2050, and I'm going to use the scenarios from this model. So what did they use as their axes to give me the two by two? A very interesting breakdown. So what they said on one axis was, is geography still going to be important? In other words, to what extent do the virtual and the mundane balance? You know, does one take over? Does the other remain crucial? That gives us one axis, the, the, if you like, the real world. I don't like calling it that, and the virtual. And then on the other axis, they chose another interesting way of exploring the problem. They said, Will the Washington Consensus hold? Okay? And the Washington Consensus is basically, you know, whatever, democracy, human rights, the IMF, you know, this sort of thing, right? So do those things hold, or are they replaced by consensuses that derive from different communities? And that, that's another pretty good access for discussing these things. So that gives us our two by two. That's what I need to proceed. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at each of these scenarios and just have a think about what it means for money, and then I'm going to move on to making a couple of predictions about what I think will happen. So the long finance model, the four scenarios, we start with the long hand. So in this model, the virtual world comes to dominate, uh, 
We have a community-based consensus replacing the current consensus. So what do you see? You see people sharing the same physical space, but not really interacting. Now, and in a way, I mean, you could kind of argue this is sort of what somewhere like London is today. You have 270 different nationalities. You know about the power of the subgroup. You have two to the end different subgroups. You have a mass of subgroups seething, but they're balkanizing. They're not talking to each other. People are, react people are going into their own affinity groups and affinity communities. And of course, as those grow in the future, those could form the basis of trade and prosperity. You could see how people would trade within those groups. You would have essentially national and international trade replaced by trade within and across uh, these community boundaries. And, you know, you can see some evidence that, uh, that uh, that's a realistic proposition. And obviously, so what does that mean for money? Well, obviously, in that world, virtual currencies would come to dominate uh, because, you know, national currencies wouldn't really mean anything. And many of those communities uh, actually wouldn't want to use them anyway. For example, there might be some of those communities, for ethnic or religious reasons, who don't want to use interest-bearing currencies, for example, or currencies from particular nation-states or part of particular currency blocks. So you could see uh, that that would lead to virtual currencies centered on those communities, replacing the, uh, the fiat currencies that we're used to today. The next scenario is the visible hand. So this is, they call it this because this is where Adam Smith's invisible hand because the Washington consensus prevails here into cyberspace, so Smith's invisible hand is made explicit because it becomes part of the code for cyberspace. It becomes part of the system. You know, in the same way, if you decide to go and play World of Warcraft, you, you, you can't set up an anarcho-syndicalist collective. There is no code for it. Uh, you have to have your raiding guild because that's the basic unit. So the visible hand uh, represents that consensus uh, brought into code. And in that example, and again, the virtual world uh, sort of dominates there. So in that world, those, uh, those um, uh, you know, trade becomes uh, central, the nexus to the interaction uh, between people in this space. Um, and because, it, because it's potentially replaced by um, a lot of trade within communities, uh, but, in a, but, but with the same consensus prevailing across all of them, so there's a lot of inter-community trade as well. You could kind of imagine a situation where within communities you have a kind of 21st century turbo barter you know, that's based on uh, personal and group reputation uh, within those communities uh, and then different kinds of commodity used as money for trade between the communities. Uh, in this one, national currencies still collapse. I should, by the way, say this, this is sort of the world we're sort of a bit living in at the moment. And actually, the foundations say that this world is not sustainable. And that's because if you project the same consensus into cyberspace as, as you do in the, in the hilariously entitled real world, you have a too homogenous situation. You don't have an economy, an ecology, that's capable of resisting shocks. It's too homogenous to survive. So they actually don't see this as surviving past about 2030. Of course, there are ways it could be more resilient. If the institutions of the Washington Consensus uh, you know, do reform and they allow more uh, flexibility, more different perspectives because of the BRICS and the post-BRIC economies, you, you could see that surviving slightly longer. I think to some people this kind of, you know, this maps slightly to the kind of techno-libertarian perspective, you know, the knowledge worker floating free of government constraint in cyberspace, uh, you know, how long that will last, I, I, I'm not really sure. She says a rugged individualism, that's very funny. Okay, uh, the next scenario is the second hand. So in the second hand, we see the Washington consensus prevail, but the mundane world prevail. So what happens here is, you know, we all think uh, that geography doesn't matter anymore, uh, despite all the evidence to the contrary. So we have these fantasies about cyberspace as being a new wild west, the Tom Paine thing. We can begin the world all over again. And this scenario says that's rubbish because sooner or later, someone will pass some stupid laws uh, about what you can and can't do on the internet, and that's the end of all of that fun. Uh, 
so that's, broadly speaking, uh, now that that's all going on. Um, and, uh, and this says that also the geography counts in ways which are actually quite hard to explain. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of evidence to support this as a theory. Uh, and in fact, you're all in, many of you are in one of the industries which proves this because, for example, institutional banking is an almost entirely dematerialized business. You, you know, it is entirely digital. You can do it with a mobile phone and a computer anywhere. And yet it's still a very clustered business. You know, it's still highly clustered in certain areas, even though it could be digital. And that's an argument which says there are other things going on as to why people uh, will always want to cluster in physical space. Uh, the last scenario is, you can read these later if you're interested. The last scenario is the many hand scenario. So this says the Washington consensus breaks down. Uh, the mundane world still dominates, but obviously the virtual world is vitally important. And this is what they call the many hands scenario. So in this, instead of having one uh, Washington consensus economy all over the world, you have lots of different kinds of economies that are based on different community consensuses. Uh, and that's why this is a more stable, it's more heterogeneous, it's more able to resist shocks. There's a partition of the economy between these different systems, which means that if one of them goes down, uh, the, others, the others can survive. And in this scenario, they say the G20, essentially, is replaced by the C50. So instead of the 20 richest countries pretending to manage national economies, of course, doing no such thing, you have the C50, which is the 50 richest cities, and they become the basis for organizing uh, and to some extent managing the economy. And in this world, you see uh, the nation state uh, no longer being responsible uh, for money, and you essentially see uh, the paper issued by these city states, as well as the commercial paper of large organizations, uh, becoming used as money. And that's, that actually, I have to say, I see that as, as the most, I personally see that as the most plausible uh, scenario, uh, although I'm sure, uh, you know, there are a lot of different reasons why uh, you might think that's not likely. Uh, and this is a scenario in which competition plays a very important role because competition between different kinds of monies becomes competition to keep the value of those monies up uh, and to some extent make them have a long-term value that people want to keep. Um, it's nothing to do with this talk, but uh, uh, one of the authors of the report says, quite perceptively, I think, in this world, people will fight for three things. They'll fight for their personal identity, they'll fight for their credit rating, and they'll fight for their parking space. So in other words, you have a reputation economy, but it's still rooted in the real world. And to me, that seems a very plausible, internally consistent scenario. Now, in that world, and by the way, be, uh, as is pointed out at the bottom there. Because most people, the overwhelming majority of people, will already be living in large cities by then, that makes it a very plausible um, scenario. Now, and in that example, the nation state, uh, Nicholas de Bock made a very good point earlier on when we were discussing this, the nation state, so it becomes like your football team. You know, it's like, you, you know, like I support Manchester City. I'm not entirely sure I would go to war for them. Uh, except under certain very extreme circumstances, obviously. Uh, but, uh, but that's how, you know, the nation state, like it's an emotional thing, you know. It, it won't really mean anything in social or economic terms. It only means things in historical and tourism terms. Okay, so in that world, cities come to dominate. And these key cities become the economic units, this is the Jane Jacobs thing about cities and the wealth of nations. They become the key economic units, and their hinterlands become the economies that they can manage. One good reason for thinking that this is a very plausible outcome is we already know that there is no such thing as a national economy. One of the reasons why politicians' efforts to manage national economies go so hopelessly wrong is because there isn't a national economy. You know, so you, so, you know, look at how the euro is going wrong right now because the economy of Greece is not the same as the economy of Germany. That's true. But the economy of London is not the same as the economy of Scotland. The economy of Wallonia is not the same as the economy of the rest of Belgium. The economy of northern Italy is not the same as the economy of southern Italy. And by trying to manage them as one economy, you do more harm than good. 
So by moving to a more regional city-based solution, you would expect economic management to improve, and of course those cities will also adopt diverse economic policies which will make them stronger against shocks. Right, what does that mean for money? That means lots of money. It means lots of different kinds of money. It means the idea that a world currency or a euro makes any sense is just frankly stupid. It's, it's, it's as ridiculous as like, you know, when you're watching something like Star Wars and a guy goes into a bar on Alpha Centauri and orders a drink and the barman says, that'll be one galactic credit, please. Like, it, it doesn't work for Germany and Greece. It's not going to work for Mercury and Pluto. It's not going to work for the Sun and Alpha Centauri. It doesn't make any sense. There's, there's no better artistic narrative about the future of money to replace it. That's why we don't think about it. But if you think about it for a second, it cannot be true. It, it, there isn't a future of one world money. There's a future of lots of monies, and those monies will be regional. The cost of... I, I mentioned at the Lyft conference in Korea four years ago, I said one of, my, one of my key predictions was that the cost of creating new kinds of money was going to collapse. And you look at what's going on with, with uh, M-Pesa and all sorts of other things. The cost of making new money is tending towards zero. So the opportunity to experiment with lots of different kinds of money is there right in front of us. So my argument is money based on these regions makes sense, but those regions aren't all physical. There are all sorts of different regions that could be the basis of new currency groups. So, for, I mean, Burgundy, for example, is a good, you know, France is a historical accident. If, you know, the, if the dice had fallen in a different way a couple of hundred years ago, you know, Burgundy would be one of the leading countries in the EU. It could well be that Burgundy makes more sense as an economic unit than France does. Wessex certainly makes much more sense as an economic unit than England does. I mean, I don't know how much longer this whole England experiment's going to last, but us in Wessex want our independence back. We can manage our economy far more efficiently. Old Clud was the ancient kingdom in Scotland, centred on Dunfermline and based on trade with Ireland. Norath is the imaginary country in EverQuest, the Sony online entertainment game. Remember we talked about this last time? Norath is the country that doesn't exist, which has a higher GDP per head than Bulgaria, which does, I'm reliably insured. Or Aragon. Aragon would make sense as an economic currency because Aragon, the historical kingdom of Aragon, which covered, you know, uh, Spain and parts of southern France and parts of southern Italy and Sicily, that makes more sense. They have the same economy. Aragon makes more sense than France as the basis of a currency. So the regions which could be responsible for the new kinds of money are very different from the nation states we have now, and there are lots of economic reasons for doing it. Right, I said I'd finish with a prediction. This is what I want to do. In England, in 1688, the time of what we still call the Glorious Revolution, we had the dawn of an industrial economy, but that economy was being held back because we were using pre-industrial money. The money at that time in England was silver coins. The coins were clipped. Uh, if you had any good coins, you wouldn't put them into the marketplace. You'd keep them at home. That's called Gresham's Law. When the Mint attempted to put new silver coins into circulation, they were immediately hoovered up and taken to Belgium and the Netherlands, where they were sold for bullion because the mint price of the coins was below their bullion value. So England had a terrible money. And that was holding back the development of the Industrial Revolution. The transaction costs associated with trade were too high. Nobody in 1688 would have predicted the invention of the Bank of England in 1694. In 1694, we went to a central bank and paper money, just out of the blue. Just one day, it kind of made sense. Not, it wasn't done for economic purposes, of course. It was done to fund a war with France. I'm not saying it wasn't done for perfectly good reasons. It's just they weren't economic reasons. But it just came along. Suddenly, we've got a Bank of England. Suddenly, there's paper money in circulation. Nobody in 1688 was saying the solution to this problem is paper money. We had the great recoinage of 1696 when all of the money, all of the money in England was called in, melted down, and made into new money. 
And that was driven by Sir Isaac Newton, who also put Britain onto a gold standard in 1717. In fact, by the time Newton died in 1727, we had a completely different money. We'd gone from using Spanish doubloons or German silver or bits of gold or whatever we could find to using pound sterling with a, with a central bank and with paper money and with a gold standard. And that happened in less than a generation. So I'm telling you that we're at the dawn of a post-industrial revolution and its efficiency is being undermined because we're still trying to use industrial age money. We're trying to take the money we've got now and shoehorn it into the post-industrial revolution. And the weak signals of the end of that money have already come. When Richard Nixon took the US off the gold standard in 1971 and officially ended the link between the US dollar and anything of any value, US dollars are imaginary. They're like World of Warcraft gold. They're not based on anything. Who still thinks there's gold in Fort Knox backing up dollars? It's ridiculous. That was one of the first weak signals. The collapse of the euro in a few months' time will be the second one. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dave. Oh, you want to So this is um, Geneva, Switzerland, and you know we have a lot of uh, chocolate, a lot of cheese, and a lot of banks in and here. And cuckoo clocks. And cuckoo clocks, yes. Um, we have many people working at banks listening to us uh, right now, and they probably wonder what's, what's in it for them if these scenarios happen. If the many hand scenario happens, what does a bank have to do to adapt? Well, I think the bank's role as the intermediary in things other than payments uh, is still important. I mean, I think that by by the time those scenarios come to play out, payments won't really be a banking business anymore. Payments will be a utility business like gas or electricity. It'll just be part of the piping uh, to move things around. So I don't think banks will be affected terribly much by that. I think um, banks uh, will lose far more of their savings and loan businesses to distributed and P2P -P solutions. That, they don't make a lot of money on some of these things, and uh, other people can do it with a lower cost base. But, you know, more currencies means more foreign exchange, uh, you know, more options, more futures, uh, more markets. Uh, it sounds ridiculous to imagine there'll be all these hundreds of currencies. And, and of course, it would be if they were paper currencies in your, in your wallet. But they're not. They'll all be in your mobile phone. And so when I want to buy something from you, my mobile phone and your mobile phone have still got to go and talk to some banks and agree on a market and make the right exchanges. So I don't think it'll be too bad for them. Thank you very much. That was Dave Birch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.